Welcome to the T2 Hubcast. Join Martin, Dave, Spencer and guests as they discuss all things personal and professional development. The T2 Hubcast, brought to you by the People Performance People. So welcome back to the T2 Hubcast with me, Martin Johnson. And me, Spencer Locker. Spencer, how are you? All right, mate. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine, thank you. What about me? Yeah, you're crisp as always, mate. We have this on. We've had this ongoing joke in lockdown. Spencer, we've all got <laughs> iPhones, and Spencer's got a Samsung. And um, Spencer's Samsung, it seems like that it's so crisp. The microphone, you always seem like more professional than, than we sound on on the iPhone. I don't know why that is, but um, I'm sure if you can hear me okay, mate, it'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. So we're. Um, I was just on with Dave. We just recorded a, a, a podcast with Dave on customer service, and he was uh, sending me a text earlier in the week, Spence, for an SOS. Yeah, he was, he was at the end of his tether. He was uh, he was melting down because he he had cabin fever and he was bored, and uh, I think he's come through the other side of it now. But how are you getting on? I'm getting on all right, to be honest with you. You you know what you know what it's like when I'm at work. I like my own space at work, don't I? So I can focus on what I've got to do. Yeah. Well, I've got this here. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't like being in work. It's just that what what I'm saying is where, when I work my best at work, I've got my own space and I've got my own space here. So it's not a big change. And that's the thing, isn't it, about the lockdown thing and, and, and then at, at the back end of it as well, um, coming out of the lockdown thing, it's all going to be change because now we've got to that stage in the situation where we're sort of used to what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and we were talking about this on the last podcast, wasn't we, around change? We've got to deal with an ever-changing environment. And uh, yeah. and that's what uh, I, I would say the most productive, but certainly that's what probably the more the more positive uh, people are doing right now. They're just they're just rolling with the punches and taking it week by week and with every announcement they're keeping communicating, shifting target and, and just, you know, dealing with the situation rather than being coming up, becoming a victim of it. And I think that's really important. Um, so, so on to this podcast, Spence, we, we want to look to the, to the future even more now. And I think, um, you know, one of the, one of the key things that we, uh, we need to look at and, and need to think about, because there are signs that this, uh, this situation is improving. There are signs that we're going to start to return slowly in the coming months and therefore, I think it's important that organisations and leaders of teams start looking ahead to, um, you know, returning to work. What is our plan for returning to work after COVID-19? What mm. do we need to consider? And do you know what? If we haven't got a reintroduction plan right now, then we're starting to fail already. We're failing to prepare already. Yeah, because it, it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be normal. So mm. despite this warning, I read a stat recently, Spence, that 10% of executives surveyed haven't done an extensive plan to return to work. No. And, no. and, that, and that's worrying. So I want to debate it on this podcast. I, I gave you the heads up and I'm sure knowing you like I do, you will have done some some digging and some prep yourself. Um, we've got our own thoughts here at T2. But yeah, let's let's chew the fat on this, Spence. Yeah. What do organisations and managers need to be considering, uh, no matter if it's two weeks from now, four weeks from now, two months from now, at some point we've got to reintroduce phase back into the working environment, but there'll be mass changes to the way we operate and we've got to get ahead of the game. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's you, you say we're talking about change. Yes, we are talking about change. I, I, I fully agree with you. I concur totally with you there. Um, but Recently, I've been doing a little bit more work on our on our um, our thoughts and views on uh, organisational design and organisational development and and organisational uh, redevelopment, and um, and I think that some of the things that we do because it's all about change and managing change, isn't it? Yeah, I'm uh, maintaining our productivity uh, and, and maintaining our focus, ma- maintaining me- momentum to a certain degree. 
Um, but well, I was looking at the, I was looking at um, sort of the three phases of um, OD or DR because there's lots of different concepts, there's lots of different ideas and ways where, of looking at it. Um, but the the three phases that we I, I was thinking of were the um, the imagination phase, the challenge phase, uh, and the change uh, and the challenge uh, the oh, what was the last one? Now it was um, it was the achievement phase. So, so we, so the imagination phase is basically everything starts with a dream, doesn't it? Um, the challenge phase is basically sh troubleshooting it all, and then the achievement phase is basically um, getting to that stage now where where we achieve what we want to achieve, but we've already talked that can be a bit of a double-edged sword. So it's keeping focus and maintaining focus and momentum, um, a bit like a Zan Shin that we were talking about not so long, long not so long ago. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it is time for. I think this has been a forced. Like uh, I think we mentioned it on another podcast, Ben. Right now, uh, chief execs, directors, senior leaders, organisations are being forced into a redesign. You know, it, it's it's not that they needed to do one, but they're being forced into one. And those people who aren't appreciating the fact that they're being forced into this uh, redesign phase. Uh, are yeah. gonna are, are gonna make mistakes and they're not gonna be fit for purpose when they return. Mm. And, and, and for example, so let's get stuck into some practical examples of what we mean, Spence. So the big obvious one for me, uh, building upon what you've just said around, like, okay, we've got to we've got to go through these phases again. We've got to strategize. We've got to redesign. We've got to be fit for purpose. The first thing you've got to look at here is when we return to to the workplace after COVID nineteen, depending on how many employees you have, but some will have small groups of employees, some will have a, a medium amount, some will have large volumes of employees across the organisation. But you've got to manage those numbers and the distancing because even when we return to work, I think there's going to be an element of social distancing still in place. Yeah. So, so, so what are you doing now to get ahead of the game in your plan to ensure that you can reintroduce a number of employees while still operating under the distancing measures? You can't, yeah. you can't have your banker desks in a contact centre with a dozen people sat within a 20-yard vicinity anymore. No. Right? So, so are you redesigning the layout of, and structure of your organisation and your office space already? Now, that sounds a really obvious one, but I bet there's people who haven't even made a plan to get ahead of the game and have a skeleton staff go into the organisation and completely redesign the floor. Mm. I mean, we had. Um, I was reading a, reading an article the other day where there's a company. Uh, it was on. It was on Forbes, I think it was. Uh, but there was a company that have actually used this as a as a bit of a a bit of a, um, a, a, a a diagnostic and an experimental phase where they're actually now looking at uh, keeping sixty percent of their workforce or 70 percent of their workforce working from home three days out of five well we'll come to that one spence because i think yeah. that's a different one i think that's a different one so yeah but, you're but, right but yeah but the, the 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 point i was trying to make there was not the fact that it was working from home but the yeah. fact that when you get people working from home you're still getting the productivity from them but when you've got people working at work you're able to socially distance because of the fewer people actually attending work yeah, that's absolutely. the angle I was coming well, from. I know you're right. Let's throw it straight yeah. into the mix. So, if number one is you've got to redesign your floor or your office yeah. space, and it's not just offices, it's it's opera, it's factory shop floors. Yeah, right? it's it's every space, working space where there is multiple employees operating. Right. So, mm. so you've got to redesign. You know, with maybe floor stickers. You know, so what will really help is visuals, visuals mm. of what two meters apart is, visuals of where to stand, where not to stand, etc. Uh, yeah. What are your signage? Uh, you know, things that people can remember the protocol by. Yeah. But the second one, to your point, is maintain remote based working. One of the one of the the wins in all of this, Spence, is the fact that yes, some organisations have have have, uh, have have been reluctant to operate remote based, but this has shown them that it can work mm. and it can be efficient and it can be effective. So, to your point, the way you can achieve point one can be to decide on which of the workforce can still work from home. So yeah. if you reintroduce 55, 50, 55% of your workforce that have to be there, but 45% can still operate from home, then yeah. it helps you actually achieve number one by making your decision on number two. So 
yeah, your first two elements of this return to work strategy has to be surely, you know, what, who can return to work and what is the protocol? How are we going to lay out? How are we going to keep social distancing? And who can we actually keep at home a little while longer to help us achieve one? And they'll go hand in hand, don't they? Yes, I agree. Yeah, I think I think they, they support each other. Absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Now, the the other thing Spencer to throw into the mix here is, and we would like to think Spencer that every human being on this planet is a hygienic human being, right? Yeah. But the, but, but the reality is, some people are scrubbers. Which, <laughs> some. Some people are scrubbers. No, let, let's be honest about this, right? I think what this has actually massively exposed is, 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 you know, we've all had to go into this protocol of, of washing hands and for X amount of seconds and sanitizing and cleaning down workspaces and wiping down door handles every day and disinfecting it. And, and it maybe is a kick up the arse for us in the workplace to understand that when we have masses of people, germs can spread, not just in pandemics, but I think part of your return to work strategy has to be around maintaining a rigorous cleaning schedule and yeah. and, and also ha, ha, an increased and more or you know stringent hygienic policy for all employees am i am i being a little bit uh you know am i being a little bit out of line there spencer or is there a case for that for many organizations i, I think i think um I think rather than making a suggestion it can be enforced a little bit more stringently like you said um, but I, I do think that there's going to be a lot of people will do it as a matter of course now. Yeah. I think the, I, I think the, I, I, again, cleanliness, uh, hygiene, personal hygiene, public hygiene, I think people will be a lot more conscious of that now. Um, yeah. That, I, I, what I mean, I mean, sorry, Spence, sorry yeah. mate. What I mean about the, the, the there's got to be a level of accountability on, on employees to, to, to maintain hygiene, right? But what I mean about um, what the company can do more is, for example, how many organisations use shared meeting rooms? So you have meeting room A, right? And in, a, in any given day, there might be two dozen people who all enter that meeting room. So what I'm talking about here is going forward, not only do you, you know, usually the protocol is you use the meeting room and then you, you put the chairs back in and you take your rubbish away afterwards, yeah. You know, going forward, is, is your protocol going to have to be increased? Certainly while COVID-19 is still around. You use the meeting room, you put your chairs under the desk, you take your rubbish away, but the sanitization equipment in the room, you wipe down every surface, you wipe down the remote controls for the TV, you wipe down the door handles when you leave. Yeah. Did you know what? Because this thing spreads more through contamination through hands through touching and spreading the germ onto surfaces, then yeah. actually it does airborne. That's what the research is showing because it can live on surfaces for far longer than it can, you know, can live in the air. So what one of the um, protocols has to be where employees are, are, are sharing equipment, sharing rooms. We need a bit of a more stringent, I think, rigorous cleaning sort of hygiene, ha hygiene policy um, because that's going to be hugely... I think instrumental in stopping the, the the rebound, if you like, the second wave, as everybody's talking about, when we do reintroduce. I think I think that's a I think it's a valid point. Um, yeah, I think it, it's just one of those things that needs to be addressed. Uh, and and as much as people are a lot more conscious about it, uh, then as an employer, I think your duty of care uh, to your employees uh, and to your customers. And to yourselves, I suppose, to a certain degree, is to to sort of promote that a bit more, a, a bit firmer, firmly, if that makes sense. Yeah, and another yeah. policy, another policy, Spence, as well as we've talked about, obviously re, re engineering your space with signage and stickers. We've talked about maintaining a, 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 some of your workforce at home to reduce the numbers, and we've talked about hygiene and cleaning policies there. One of the innovative things I've seen organisations already planning to do is mandate temperature checks and travel histories uh, prior to re-entering the organisation. Mm. So, um, again, it's such a great area because as we keep seeing on the news with Chris Whitty and the team, they're saying you can temperature check somebody on the Monday, but because this thing has an incubation period of 14 to maybe 20 days, mm. 
it, it's impossible. You can't temperature check somebody every single day. But what I'm saying here is, at the first point, if anybody shows symptoms, have you got the equipment on site to do a mandate temperature check and send them home from work? If it's a, if it's even one iota or above average, and and there's there's and also documenting people's travels, uh, even when they return to work, wherever they're they are being, you need a docu a, a sort of, of a log of of travel. You know, where has people been? Has this person travelled extensively over the last fourteen to twenty one days? You know, does that put them at risk in terms of reintroducing them into the office, etc.? Um, so there's innovative little things like that that I think organisations can be thinking about. Uh, every, you know, because every little helps, I think, really. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it's again. It's it, we keep talking about returning to normal and getting back to normal. I think we need to get it straight in our head that that's not going to happen. Normal, our ne new normal is going to be different to our old normal. Yeah. What about, <clears throat> what about what, for example, Spence? To your point, what about things like greetings and handshaking and stuff like that for meetings? I mean, do you think that's going to completely disappear? That basic human, you know, gesture of, you know, I'm 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 going for a meeting. I'm going to shake your hand when I when I when I enter and when I leave. Do you, do you think that's going to? Be, I I I think there's going to be a huge hesitancy around all of that stuff for at least the remainder of 2020. I think it's going to be different things for different people. I think there's certain people out there who will will not will will do the old elbow touch or a nod or a smile or whatever. But you know as well as I do, there's people out there that are huggers, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and 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 um, and and they, and this this time this this potential the situation we find ourselves in, they just they just cherish human contact. And I don't mean we in in a weird way. But I mean, they are they are extroverts. They are warm, loving, caring people who like um, physical contact. So I think it'd be difficult for them to to shake off the um, the shaking hands bit. I think they're really looking forward to the time when they can do that again. Whereas there's yeah. other people who will will naturally go right. Okay, I'm 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 comfortable with this. Yes, absolutely, mate. Absolutely, I agree. And I think as time goes on and we it's a fluid situation i think slowly but surely the confidence will will return as the cases drop and hopefully as you know if we get to the end game which would be you know to to, to hopefully beat it and that may take some time then i think things will slowly return to normal with things like general gestures and gestures and greetings and that type of stuff um uh, you know there's, but there's all sorts of more practical things in the short term that we can be can be doing. I, I read somewhere, Spence, recently that one organisation uh, they're reopening their doors next week um, due to essential work. And one of the policies they've got quite a large infrastructure, a large bu building. One of their policies is going to be every single door in the building, every door mm. will be will be continuously open. So every through door, every meeting room door, every mm -hmm. office door, everything will be open. And they've calculated that they've got 264 doors in the building. And, and their theory is that if the doors are constantly open, not nobody has to open or close them, which, yeah. which instantly takes uh, thousands of touches per day away from, you know, that it takes that risk away from every employee. And some people in, uh, have questioned that, saying, well, what if we need to have a private discussion? What if it's a private meeting? And the organisation have said, well, listen, you need to lower your voices or you need to find a way because we are having every single door open. This is more important. So, you know, that I thought was quite bold, but quite innovative, you know, because if you think about 200 and odd doors and, and hundreds of employees all walking through them every day, that type of spread, that is the type of situation that spreads a virus. So... You know, there's plenty of practical stuff that people can be thinking about. And I think the main point we're making here, Spence, is are you even having these discussions? Are, are you even thinking about, as an organisation, as a leadership team, are you even thinking about your protocol? Are you having any marketing collateral drawn up already to distribute to your employees before they return to work, saying, we are going to return on this date and this is the protocol for maintaining coronavirus? You know, yeah. and, and having it simple and concise and easy for people to understand. Yeah, and I think I think if you're not having those conversations or 
you are having the conversations, but you're using it or you're viewing it from a threat perspective rather than a challenge perspective, um, then you need to sort of re reapproach that because the, rather than this, uh, rather than looking at these things as as this situation has been a, a threat to how we operate, how we do business, how we communicate. We need to see it as a challenge. Uh, we need to embrace some of these things, um, look on it as a, an opportunity to do things differently. Get some of these people who you employ um, in your in your management teams or whatever, the people who've got, um, who are outside the box thinkers, people who are creative thinkers, um, get them in on it. You see what they can come up with. They've probably thought about things anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. <clears throat> the other thing I was going to ask you, Spence, maybe the final point of brainstorm on this podcast was yeah. everything we've talked about so far has been about redesigning. So your, your infrastructure, your, your facility, your, off, your physical office space. We're talking about protocols, you know, of meeting rooms and uh, hygiene policies and all of this type of stuff. Um, we've talked about maintaining remote-based working versus on-site working. No, we've talked about um, a lot of things, but one of the things I want to talk about is how important do you think it's going to be to rebuild the workplace morale from a human element? Because there'll be there'll be there'll be a couple of different approaches when we reintroduce back into the workplace. There'll be those people who come back and they cannot wait, Spence, because they're chomping at the bit, they're bored, and they can't wait to get back see their uh, colleagues. You know. Have, get that morale going again and all the rest of it. But there'll be other people who are incredibly anxious and nervous to return to work for, for many different reasons. And as we know, the depending on, on your motivations and, and, and what you're motivated by, you know, this is how it's going to affect people returning to the workplace. But all in all, I think organisations have got to instantly find a way of trying to pick the morale up because successful businesses thrive on motivated workforce expense. We know that. So it's important for leaders to invest and rebuild workplace morale when they return. You know, acknowledge any employee concerns, you know, communicate effectively in terms yeah. of the forward-looking plan. Uh, what is the new operating environment? You know, it's a, still a fluid thing, but we need to do what we can to galvanise and build that team spirit. And, you know, we're not saying it's, it's never too early to go and, do a team building event or whatever it might be. We're not talking about that, but we need to do something to engage our people and lift the spirits. Would you agree? Yes. I think you're, uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, building morale, uh, giving people what they need to achieve their unconscious motivators. So you've got a, a big bunch of different people with different motivators working for you. Yeah. Effective communication, um, which is difficult when you're in this situation, when, when I mean, we can see when we're watching the media and watching the news um, that you've got the, uh, the the media, the journalists demanding, when are we going to get this exit? When, when we need a plan, we need this, we need that, we need the other. And I sort of get that, but this is something totally new. Yeah. Um, and and I can also understand why the government are turning around and sort of saying, well. We can't give you information until we get some information, and we're we're, we're going blind by this. Um, and and really, it's the consequences of that 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 the problem is. So if we start looking at this situation, the government know that if they give certain right, we'll do this, we'll do that. This is our plan, and then when they meet that, when they don't meet that target, or when the when the plan changes, everybody starts. Ah, you said this. Ah, you said that. It's a bit of blame culture thing. But when you're in an organisation that isn't a blame culture, you can start saying, if this happens, this is what we're going to do. But this might not happen. And if it doesn't happen, then this might be what we're going to do. So, yeah, you've got to – people will need information, but you've got to put your plan – you've got to start planning, but you've got to plan for every eventuality, haven't you? You have. And as an individual leader, you've also got to just walk the floors and get to your people and just say, listen, because going back to work isn't doesn't mean it, you're going to be – carrying the same wor workload and focusing on the same things as you was prior to COVID-19. You know, yeah. it might be quiet. Your customers might not be back yet. There might not be a lot to do. There might be loads to do, right? So yeah. leaders walk in the floors to every individual and just saying, listen, here's what we need to do this week. Focus on one thing at a time. Here's the plan. And, and that's going to, like you say, it's going to change and it's going to flow yeah. and it's going to... So just walk in the halls and communicating 
is, is one of the best ways you can lift the morale um, because people aren't going to be sure what's required of them when they get back or how busy they're going to be or how not busy they're going to be, who they can contact, who, it's, who they can't contact, who should they chase. You know, if you're working in finance and you've got to chase a load of money in, but half of your uh, ledger is still on fair loud leave, you don't want to be sending snotty emails chasing money in. You need to approach it with a bit of sensitivity. So everything's going to change. And therefore, yeah. leadership and communication is really, really important. Now, now the last point here, Spence, I think I said it last time, but this is the last point, is this. And, and this is something I'm thinking about as well. And I feel so passionate about and I'm going to challenge people after this because we should all learn a lesson from COVID-19. What learnings are you going to embed from COVID-19? What is the biggest takeaway that has shown you your biggest vulnerability as a business? Does this make yeah. sense? So, yeah, it does, yeah. So for me, most organisations will have learned a huge lesson from this, including us at T2, Spence. You know, yeah. if this happened again, which it is possible, and it doesn't always have to be a pandemic, it can be a multitude of things, but let's say something like this happened again. Can your business, you know, thrive if it was locked down for three months? And what do you have to do going forward to ensure that your business model will allow you to thrive if you was locked down for three months. One of the biggest eye-openers for every organi organization out there, Spence, should be reoccurring revenue. So yeah. uh, organizations who have struggled through COVID-19 are the ones who live month to month, hand to mouth. You make an X amount of sales, you deliver X amount of product or service. Whereas the ones who have had an easier run are the ones who have got ongoing customers on reoccurring revenue models. Because their money has hit the bank or their invoices have gone out even during COVID-19. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so, very much so, yeah. And reoccurring revenue is only one less than people should learn from COVID-19. There's probably a hundred expense, you know, mm. from did we have enough equipment to send every employee home? Well, no, we didn't. We was running around curries, you know, on the last day of lockdown trying to get PCs. You know, do, do, yeah. we, we, do we have the ability to connect to our systems from a remote-based uh, server, etc. All of these things, which people have probably had a real eye-opener, and I think one of the return-to-work strategies has to be, from a leadership perspective, what are our lessons and learnings from COVID-19? Yeah. That's 27 minutes gone, Spence. Yeah. Any final points from you on this? You know, we are on the precipice if you like of, of an announcement of what's next yeah whether it's, two, whether it's two or three weeks more lockdown at some point in the coming <coughs> month or two <clears throat> people will start returning to work yeah anything else we haven't covered spence with a few minutes to go that you want to cover i think there's there's, there's still there's still uh the legs with this i think there's still a load of things that you can because this is the thing is as you start talking about this it brings other things into play and you said oh yeah i haven't thought about this no yeah i haven't thought about that so there's, I think there's a lot more, but I think we've covered the basics. I think we've got the starting points there. Well, if um, we did a part two next week, Spence, what what else yeah. could we chuck in? Um, I think I think we should we could chuck in a lot more about um uh, the actual uh the the productivity uh, rather than yeah we've got we've got a plan yes we could do this in the future start looking at the productivity as you said recurring revenue how can we how can we start looking at recurring re revenue for different organisations um, how can that be promoted with po possibly remote based workers um, yeah and another, another thing Spence how could we possibly downsize our office space reduce costs and allow 40 percent to work from home that's what i was just about to say just about to say so there's things like that that we might we, we might want to consider all right well let's have a look at it spence and uh, as always we can come back and do a part two but yeah fascinating insight i think we are in this is the first piece of content we've done spence since since march that is focused on returning in the future because yeah. i think all of the content we've done recently has been managing and getting through COVID-19 and lockdown and how we can still perform and produce. Whereas I think now it's like, okay, we need to have our eyes or one eye on the future as well. It's a fluid thing. But if you aren't, if you aren't having these conversations now, then you'd be a, you're behind the curve without, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Spencer Locker. Thank you very much, mate. Cheers, Martin.
and we'll be back shortly with another T2 Hubcast. Cheers.